get more into kind of the mathematical derivation of Kirkendall. So before we get into this, this is where I want to make a plug for uh, a book. So I think it's Kinetics of Materials by Samuel Allen and Craig Carter. So Allen, Carter. Uh, this is the best kinetics book uh, I've ever read. Uh, really the best textbook I've ever read, period. Um, incredibly clear, and we're going to be going through some of the derivations presented in that book, uh, but I'd highly recommend uh, purchasing that. So, anyways, let's go back to our kind of idea of the diffusion couple in Kirkendall. So, we have one material one, material two, uh, and each of these two different materials is going to have uh, some type of different diffusivities. So, let's look at, for example, the case that diffusivity one is greater than diffusivity two. How do we know what material has a larger diffusivity? There's a couple ways. So generally we're speaking, so the smaller atom has the larger diffusivity. So larger D. So copper is generally, or excuse me, not copper, carbon is generally faster than iron, or diffuses faster than iron. Um, you could also look at which has larger diffusivity based on the solubility as well. Um, we're going to get into this in uh, basically our lecture five phase diagrams. So hold on that for a little bit later. But again, it's which molecule is more soluble. If it's more soluble, then it usually diffuses faster. And the third, oftentimes you'll see, for example, let me kind of color this blue. Oftentimes we'll look and we'll draw a concentration profile here. So let's go ahead and draw that here. Concentration as a function of this x distance. So if I drew a plot like this, and again, I'm trying to show like this is the same x-axis here. So if I show this here, and then I show the blue, alternatively like this, what's going to happen here? This concentration is going from 0 to 1. So what this is saying is that for my material 1, I'm basically at 1, and then when I drop off here, I drop and I'm almost close to 0. But look at material 2 on this side. I'm not starting off, I mean, I'm starting off at 1, but you can see I end up at a higher concentration. So from this plot, I would deduce that diffusivity of 2 is greater than diffusivity of 1. So let's, uh, so that's kind of the third way that you can figure out which has a higher diffusivity. But let's say that diffusivity, you know, the diffusivity of 1 is greater than the diffusivity of 2. Let's go ahead and that out. Diffusivity of 1 greater than diffusivity of 2. Now, in this, um, we saw from Kirkendall that the flux of atoms may not be zero, but we do have to kind of uh, rethink about our reference frame. So we are going to define a reference plane uh, and imagine that we place some inner marker on this reference plane. So in these arrays of atoms, I'm going to put my marker just basically somewhere along here. This is really going to be my marker. This is going to be, I'm going to put this right at the interface right here. This is my marker, my C frame. So the C-frame is I'm sitting right on the plane of atoms. Uh, so now we want to kind of go back and uh, kind of discuss this idea of, again, looking at the diffusion of these different uh, materials. So we know that diffusivity of 1 is greater than diffusivity of 2. Uh, and more importantly, we saw that for Kirkendall, we know that based on Kirkendall and based on the vacancy mechanism of diffusion, vacancy diffusion mechanism, the flux of atoms across any given plane is not equal to zero. That's very true. That's true. But we do have some, uh, basically, rules from thermodynamics. Specifically, we have the conservation, conservation of mass. And we, specifically here, we have conservation of sites. So the total number of sites number of sites cannot change. We are assuming that we are not dealing uh, we're not dealing with a chemical reaction that's creating more sites. We're not changing the volume of our material at all. We're not destroying or creating mass. So we need to have this conversation of uh, uh, conservation of mass. So or the conservation of the number of sites. So if the number of sites can't change, we can look at it and again this is the whole perspective of sitting on the lattice sitting in this C frame here, and we are going to say that when we look at kind of these atoms, that basically what can move here? What can diffuse across this plane right here? Well, atoms of type 1 can diffuse, atoms of type 2 can diffuse, and what else can diffuse? What type of diffusive mechanism can occur? So what can move across this lattice? So we could say 
Blue atoms, green atoms, what else can move? The number of sites has to be maintained. Aha, the vacancies can also move. So we need to consider the flux of the atoms and the flux of the vacancies. And our condition in the C-frame is, again, because the total number of sites must be the same, conserved, we know that the flux must be equal to zero. So the flux of one, two, and the vacancies must be equal to zero. So if, let's go ahead and look at this uh, scenario here. Where is the flux? Where are the atoms one going to move to? So let's go think, think back to our first, fix first law. So diffusion of one is minus D, and that's a gradient of C. So we want to move from high concentrations to low concentrations. So the flux, the direction, one is going to move towards here. What do I know about the magnitude of my flux? Well, in this diffusion couple, J2 is just going to be C1, C2, grad, C1, C2. Uh, what's going to modulate the magnitude of my flux? Well, my concentration gradient and diffusion couple is pretty much the same, right? I mean, I'm, again, I'm assuming that I'm using, you know, this is X. Let's say that this is, you know, 100 micrometers. This is, you know, we're evenly distributed. You know, the, the gradient is going to be essentially the same. So what's going to change the magnitude? Aha, the diffusivity. So we said the diffusivity of 1 is greater than the diffusivity of 2. So if I want to kind of draw the relative magnitude of the fluxes, I can use this and know the diffusivity is going to change the magnitude of my flux. So I know that the flux is going to go in this direction here for J1 in the C-frame. What about the flux of 2? Well, that's going to go to here. Why did I draw this shorter? Well, because, just like what we said, the diffusivity of 2 is less than the diffusivity of 1. So the magnitude of the flux is also going to be smaller. But I need to have this condition, right? that the total fluxes must be equal to zero. So what does that tell me about the flux of my vacancies? Well, it tells me the flux of the vacancies is going to move in this direction. Again, ignore the action. So the flux of vacancy is going to complete. You can see sound, the magnitudes, they cancel each other out. So the flux of vacancies is equal to this. There it is. So that's kind of our qualitative understanding of what's kind of happening here. And it's all due to this conservation of the number of sites, etc. Now, I kind of wrote this new notation of D1 and D2. So that is different from our intrinsic diffusivity, which we kind of uh, basically, this intrinsic diffusivity is different from the self-diffusivity. So the self-diffusivity is this kind of star value right here. So the self-diffusivity changes. So once I kind of create this diffusion couple again, so one and two, my diffusivity changes. And now it's dependent on kind of the chemical activity uh, of my component one in this, you know, diffusion couple now. Um, you can make some kind of assumptions and kind of read through here. So this is basically, um, this is the average site volume. So we can assume that the size of our site does not change as a function of concentration. So we can kind of just assume this to be, you know, uh, this gets canceled out. So this becomes zero. And now you can see this nice relationship that we obtain between self-diffusivity this and our intrinsic diffusivity uh, D1 here. So you can kind of see how that changes once you kind of set up this diffusion couple. Excellent. I hope everyone's uh, fine and happy with that. Um, now, we've been talking about, and this kind of sets up our expression on kind of the C frame, um, but we want to be able to describe essentially how does, you know, there's going to be these markers or essentially this interface. And we want to know what direction it's going to move and what's going to be the velocity of this interface motion. So we can do that by actually invoking this idea of another frame of reference. So in the C frame, we were imagining that we we're sitting, basically we have this little marker, we we're sitting on that atomic plane. And we're seeing how things move in that atomic plane. But in the V frame, also called the uh, kind of a laboratory uh, frame, but it's also called the, it's called the V frame because it's the volume fixed frame. You can also kind of say the lab frame. Lab frame. We are going to assume that there's no change in the overall volume uh, during the diffusion. And this gives us this condition that because there's no change in volume, mass must be conserved, volume must be conserved, we are going to be able to measure the velocity of the particle because we're going to be taking, again, a, we're not now, we're not sitting on a plane of atoms. We're looking now at the whole picture. 
we're, our eyes are kind of looking at this entire volume here. Those are my glasses. Here's my glasses. Those are my eyes. I'm looking at the whole picture here. That's the kind of idea. So if the volume is conserved, now I have this condition that the flux of the atoms, you know, times the essentially, you know, the flux times essentially the atomic volume for each of the components must be equal to zero. So once you do that, you can rewrite essentially the flux of the atoms in the uh, V-frame. And now you can kind of see that the flux of each of the atoms in the V-frame depends on the diffusivity of both components. So we now defined, again, we had self, self diffusivity, which was D star. We had intrinsic, which was D1. And now in the V-frame, we're looking at interdiffusivity, which depends on, my diffusivity depends on the diffusivity of component both one and two. And so we can then use one more expression, uh, and then we'll be kind of done with the math, and I'll be glad that you stayed with me for this. But we can now write an expression for the velocity of the C-frame in res with respect to the V-frame using this expression here below. Uh, and that takes a, a little bit of work and kind of the derivation. If you're interested in that, we can kind of uh, go through that together. But you can see here what happens if D1 is equal to D2 by intrinsic diffusivities. Well, then I don't get any motion. The velocity of my interface is zero, which is what you expect for self-diffusion, right? You're not seeing any kind of you know, motion of these vacancies uh, and planes you know, disappearing or Kirkendall pores uh, occurring. But if D1 does not equal to D2, the planes will move and we'll observe something exactly similar to what Kirkenthal observed in his um, diffusion couple of copper and zinc. So that is the huge finding that we can see here. So we can measure the velocity of this interface just by simply knowing this concentration gradient, knowing basically the volume of our site, and then finally with, uh, with our uh, diffusivities. So with that, we can figure out, we can calculate what is the velocity of that interface, and now we can actually go through our kind of formalism and see where is that interface going to move and how fast. So next time, we're going to kind of look at this from a much more conceptual uh, understanding point. So I hope that uh, we'll actually make this look clear. So thank you for sticking with me with the math. Math is done. Figures and uh, basically drawings are coming. So I hope you're excited for that. Thanks. See you in the next video. Bye.